In this video, I'm going to be talking about lateral loads like earthquake and wind. Ugh. No, but but seriously though, my name is Tyler Lay. I'm a professor at Oklahoma State University. At the end of this video, I'm going to show you some more exact methods. So if you are a person that likes exact methods, then you should pay attention to the very, very end of this video. But there's some awesome stuff I'm going to show you before that. I get asked this question all the time. How do you find your design loads for your building? If you're working on a class project, this could be a good video for you. Now, this is a beautiful concrete building. This is what we're talking about designing. And I already have a video talking about gravity loads. You should check that out if you have not seen it yet. We're gonna be all about lateral loads today like earthquakes and also winds. Oh, yeah, winds, a big focus of the video today is going to be about winds. Yeah, winds, like sweeping down the plane, right? This is this big wind front that's coming down about to push on this building and we wanna know how to distribute the loads. We're gonna first look at the top of the building down and look at it in plan view. Now in this building, these little squares at the corners are gonna be the columns and these dashed lines are going to be the beams. The wind is gonna be blowing from one side of the structure and we're gonna be using something called tributary area. A lot of tributary area. If you haven't seen me talk about tributary area before, you should probably watch the gravity load video. Now we're gonna first talking about frames. Now there are two assumptions with this. The first assumption we're, we're gonna use is that the size of all the columns are similar to one another. That means the largest area divided by the smallest area is less than 2.5. Don't worry, we'll show you how to do some bigger columns later, but that is assumption number one. Number two, the building has to be mostly symmetrical, but again, there's more advanced techniques at the end of this video. So this is what the structure looks like. Here's the load on it, and we have frame number one there at the top, frame number two in the middle, and frame number three is going to be at the bottom. Now we're gonna break these up into tributary areas. These blue lines show and break up the structure into different parts. Now that blue line is drawn halfway between the columns. Now we draw another blue line there. Where's it go? Halfway again between the columns. So we take this load at the top and that is going to go to frame number one. We take the load in the middle and again, that is going to be responsible for frame number two and the load at the bottom that will go to our friend frame number three. So as this load comes down, we're going to have, we've broken these things up again into frame number one, frame number two, and frame number three. Let's focus in on frame number two and let's put our eye on the side and look at it in terms of the elevation. So here's what the whole structure looks like. We see individual columns and beams and the wind coming from the left. Now we're going to use tributary area again. Where is it placed? Halfway between the floors. We draw another one and another one. And then what we're going to do is break these areas up. We're going to turn all of this and smash it down into a point load. Do that again here. Do that again here. And the stuff at the bottom that stuff, we get to ignore it. We get to not worry about it. It's so close to the ground, we don't have to be concerned with it. So we have our loads now. Now you might be asking the question, how do you find how much these loads are? I know where they go now, but how big are they? Well, to do that, we go back to our 3D drawing. We've looked at what we've done. We've broken this up in a checkerboard type pattern. And each one of these areas, these tributary areas is going to get a certain amount of load. We have our pressure, our load divided by area. We multiply by area number one and we get a point load that goes there. And we'd find area number two and we find a point load that goes at that joint right there. So we do this again and again and again over the surface of the building. It's gonna look something like this. So in 2D, it looks like this, but imagine this stacked for all the different frames and you can get what it looks like in 3D. So how do we find our shears and our moments? And for that, we're gonna use our favorite computer program. I like Risa 2D. You should check this video out if you wanna learn how to use it. It's very valuable and it's free and it was pretty simple to use as well. But you put a single frame typically into the software at a time and then you solve for your moments and your shears. But you do need to estimate the sizes of your beams and your columns when you put them in. You don't have to get exactly right, but you need to do your best. Why do you have to do this? Because load is distributed by stiffness. This is an indeterminate problem and so it does matter the size of the beams and the columns and the relative what they are to one another. So now we're going to go back to that assumption I had before about you not having columns 
ones that were too large. We're gonna make that go away. And that is kind of like using big columns. Big columns, big columns are kind of another word for walls. Walls are just very, very, very long columns. So I'm showing a plan view where I've replaced a few of the columns with a wall right there. And, and so what is big? What is big? Right, that might be a great question you wanna ask yourself. Well, big means it has a very large moment of inertia compared to all the others, all the other columns in the system. So let's do some math to explain what I'm talking about. If we go back to our plan, we pick some typical dimensions. Let's say I have a 30 foot column spacing and we have a 14 inch by 14 inch columns. And now what we're going to do is to compare the stiffnesses. This wall is massive, it's large, and, and we get to cube this dimension. Because if you remember the moment of inertia, it's 1 12th BH cubed, and the H is the long dimension. We get to cube that in that 1 12th BH cubed. So if you find the moment of inertia of the wall, and you compare it to all the other columns, the wall has a moment of inertia that's 1,133 times larger than all of the other moment of inertia of the columns put together. Yeah, yeah, isn't that insane? Yeah, that means the wall takes 1,133 times more load than all the columns put together. That means that we can assume that the columns take nothing and the wall takes everything. You might say, whoa, 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 what if my wall wasn't that big? Well, even if your moment of inertia was 10 times, 10 times what all your columns were put together, that is gonna dwarf and just t suck up all the load. Because remember, load is distributed by stiffness. So if we have our big structure like this, it means that we can take all of this load on the side, turn it into a point load and put it smack right there on the wall. So we take all of this load, we can again envision it on the side here. And instead of having columns, we have this big wall over here. And we can again use our tributary area concept to break it up and we can turn those into point loads. Now those point loads are going to travel all the way through the entire rest of the structure and go right to the wall. The wall is gonna take all of the load. Why is that again? Because it's so stiff. So if in 3D, here's our tributary areas, we take area number three, we could take the load divided by the area multiplied by area number three, and we get a point load, we do that again here, we do that again however many times you need to do it, and then you apply it to the walls. But wait, you still might not get it. You still might not quite understand what's going on, so here's an analogy for you. A normal frame structure with columns and beams, when the wind starts to blow on it, it's going to bend over by a bunch of trees, right? It's every single column is not that stiff, and so they're all gonna bend together to try to resist it. But if I have my friend the wall, and that wind starts blowing down, this is a different beast, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Incredible Hulk. This is Hulk, we got Hulk on our side, and he's just gonna stop all that load. It doesn't matter about the trees. The load's gonna go right through the trees, all the way to the Hulk. So walls are much stiffer, much stronger than moment frames, and that's so why, why they're so widely used. That's why people use them, because you can economically build buildings with walls. So in summary, tributary area is a powerful tool to distribute lateral loads into your structures if you kind of understand them. And complicated structures can be simplified if you understand the stiffness and how to distribute loads. So I hope you liked this video. If you did, please give me a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, leave me a comment below about your lateral load type questions. And of course, check me out on Instagram and Facebook at concrete.tyler. But oh yeah, there's more. For you people that want the exact answer out there, this is for the after hours program. So how do you find a more exact solution? I wanna know the true answer. Yeah, I'm not sure you really do, but if you do, then this is how you would do it. So why would you ever do this? Well, if you had a structure that was very, very complicated or if you needed to check drift on your structure. So you would put, one way to do it is to put everything in a 3D model, then hit the solve button. Lots of young people seem to think this is the great way to go. You put this complicated stuff in, you hit a button, it lights up like fireworks, you get all kinds of stuff everywhere, and they think it's awesome. Better be careful. 
you better make sure you estimate the size of all your beams and columns. And if your estimate's off, you got to go back and revise them. And you got to look carefully at your inputs and outputs to make sure they're all logical. You don't have any errors or any other mistakes or anything else going wrong. Because remember, garbage in equals garbage out. And there are concerns, at least my concerns. This is complicated. This is time consuming and it is easy to make a mistake and the software is costly, um, but there are benefits. It is easy to update. It does generate a BIM model for you. So if you have to do that, this might be a good way to go for you. And it is the best solution out there for extremely complicated structures. But I kind of like this approach. You can build several 2D models that when hooked together can behave like a 3D model and then it's much, much easier to manage. So how do I find the displacement of a building, one might ask you. And this is called the drift. Why would you do this? If I have all these buildings like this, we're concerned that they might smack together. That would be horrible, right? And in high rise structures, drift often ends up controlling, especially in large cities. But what would you would do is you could hook up frame number one, frame number two, and frame number three, put them all in your program, and you attach them with something called a rigid link. What's a rigid link? It is a member with a massive area inside the computer program. How do you do this? Well, you go inside the computer program, you draw your member, you give it an area, and you just keep typing nines, 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 nines. You fill it up with nines, that's a massively big area, right? These are our rigid links, these little blue things here. You hook them together with pins to make sure they don't give you any moment capacity, and you put the loads on and they go. This makes the models all work together. This makes them share their stiffnesses and their loads with one another. If one starts deflecting too much, it gives its load to another. This is beautiful, simple, elegant and easy. There are benefits. It's fast. It's easy to troubleshoot. It is accurate. It is simpler than those 3D models that are out there. There are concerns though. Is it accurate enough? Sometimes it's not. If there's twisting involved, if your centroid of your structure is different from where your loading is, you have to take that into account. It does not work for some building layouts and it does not give you the BIM model. If you need the BIM model, you may want to go another way. But in summary, be careful if you use advanced modeling techniques out there because you ask yourself this question. Are you spending your time fixing all the bugs in the model or are you really designing something for somebody in the world? Most structures I feel can be designed with simple models if you understand tributary area, loads, and also stiffness. This is truly the end. Thank you for sticking around. I appreciate you. Take care, everybody. Bye.